It is February 1942 when the U.S. Censorship Bureau intercepts five remarkable letters. They have returned unopened from one address in Buenos Aires where they were sent by five different women in the U.S. All the letters contain specific information about dolls. A fisherman doll with a net on his back, an old woman doll with wood on her back, and a little boy doll. One of the letters also mentioned that one Mr. Shaw was sick, but will soon be fit enough to go back to work. Analysts soon figure out that the letter aren't talking about dolls, it's about warships. Like Mr. Shaw is a reference to Destroyer Shaw, which had rejoined the Pacific Fleet after being damaged in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. This is another episode of Spies and Ties. I'm Astrid Dinard and hello my darlings. The intended destination of the letters is a Japanese Imperial Army agent station collecting data from their spies in the America. But it has ceased to operate. Only the Japanese failed to inform the agent in America who is still sending letters there. Hmm. No new letters are discovered, but the FBI starts a massive investigation to find their origin. The mess the Japanese have created is fairly typical of the state of their intelligence operations in 1942, or as the Japanese staff officer will put it, the Japanese army did not take intelligence nearly seriously enough. At South Asia Army Headquarters, we had no proper system, no analytic section, no resources. That's how bad it was. The situation before 1942 is somewhat hmm, better. During the interwar years, the Japanese tried to give intelligence real focus. They accumulate thousands of reports on U.S. Navy all over the Pacific. Japanese fishing ships with radio equipment go up and down the U.S. coastlines, collecting data. Big agent networks are established in Panama and Mexico, and Japanese companies infested with government informants venture out to do, hmm, what? Business in the States. Exchange students covertly interview drunk sailors in Californian harbors. Naval attaches attend universities as language officers, and Shinto monks even play a role reportedly by attaching little automatic cameras to pigeons and having them fly over military bases. Now, you may know that when the US enters the war, they think it's mainly Japanese Americans, all Japanese Americans, that pose an intelligence threat. So they lock them up in camps. But it's not Japanese Americans who are mainly working for the Japanese. No, in 1933, Toshio Miyazaki is a Japanese exchange student at Stanford University. Okay, he isn't. That's just a cover. Under the code name Mr. Tunny, he's a Japanese spy runner who specializes in tracking down ex-military personnel to get them to work as spies. Hmm? For what? For cash. Like Harry Thompson, an ex-naval serviceman out of a job who is put on his payroll. Disguised as if he still is in service, Thompson gathers information by sneaking onto ships. Another one of his spies is Lieutenant Commander John S. Farnsworth, who has a lavish lifestyle beyond his means, racking up death. When he is dishonorably discharged, Mr. Tunney is only waiting to save him, and soon he is collecting information from former colleagues and officers' wives. The Japanese set up many such cells across the US and the rest of the world. With similar methods, they operate a small army of diplomats, military, and commercial attaches in Axis countries like Germany, Italy, and neutral countries like Sweden, Switzerland, Spain, and Portugal. Before they are at war with the Western allies, they are all over the colonial world 
quoting spies. Japanese agents who master the English language work in officers' clubs or provide services in allied bases and harbors. One method they use is to set up male brothels to blackmail unsuspecting local or European officers after mm, an illegal visit. But Japanese intelligence also has another role. Covert operation and seeding wars behind the front lines. The Japanese Navy Third Department runs a network of agents throughout East Asia to identify nationalists and anti-colonial looking for allies against their colonial overlords. The Japanese army deployed to Kumo Kikan or special service organizations specialized in stirring up fifth column activity. With the signing of the Tripartite Pact in 1940, Japan gains official access to German spies and informants, such as Bernhard Kuhn, here he is, who lived in Honolulu on Hawaii with his family. The whole family chip in on the spy business. His daughter opens a beauty parlor and casually interviews wives of US officers. His 11-year-old son, Hans, is regularly dressed up in a cute US sailor outfit and taken to the harbor, where unsuspecting Navy personnel invite the young patriot onto ships, where young Hans spots and memorizes key details about weapon systems and such. But by that time, the glory days of the Japanese intelligence, if they ever existed, are already ending. It's the gradual collapse of the US spy networks and the failure to crack allied codes that has the biggest impact. Miyazaki, Thompson and Farnsworth are caught by the FBI already in 1936. Turns out that exchange students in their mid-30s are considered suspicious by the FBI as does former U.S. military men carelessly walking in and out of the Japanese embassy, calling your handler on open phone lines and paying your bills with fresh $100 notes when you're supposedly broke. This is a wake-up call for the FBI. Japanese business and diplomats are put under intense surveillance and the over 100 Japanese citizens with fake passports are apprehended. In 1940, the US breaks Japanese diplomatic codes and the roll-up of moles and rats continue to pick up speed. In early 1941, they arrest another student, Itari Tashibana, and again they roll up his network of six agents, including a distinguished British RAF veteran, Major Frederick Rudland. The arrests make major headlines as a great success in counterintelligence. But when the FBI go through the network's accomplishments, they conclude that over, hold your shorts, 70% of their communicated information was publicly available. Yes, that's right. They're relying on the news. Every day, officers skim through Reuters, AP, Life magazine, Time, the New York Times, and military magazines. It might seem pointless, but it's actually not completely useless. Like in January 41, when Life magazine publishes a photo of the British ambassador to the US aboard the British battleship King George V on it, the latest anti-aircraft rocket launcher is clearly visible in the back. A piece of technology that the Japanese Navy did not know anything about. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese diplomats, naval attaches and language officers who played a central role in the US spy wings have to leave the country. And despite the fear that Japanese Americans would be ready to cover the gap, they aren't. Not only are the vast majority of the 120,000 who are locked up loyal Americans, the Japanese haven't even tried to transfer their operations to them. With a lack of other information sources, they resort to extracting information from POWs, often under horrible torture. 
First of all, that's not cool at all, but it's also not useful. A person under torture will say anything for it to stop. And that's a big problem for the Japanese. You know why? Because as we shall see in a moment, there is an ingrained culture to believe only what is convenient, what your superior wants to hear. So massive amounts of interrogation under torture leads to an endless flow of information that is at best dubious. But much of this seems rather clumsy and amateurish, you say. Well, you're not wrong. A historian, Hando Katutsutoshi, offers his explanation. Intelligence became a backwater for officers who were perceived as unfit for more responsible postings. Strategic decision-making was concentrated in the hands of perhaps 20 people, military and naval. Even if our intelligence services had gained access to important information, it would have remained unexploited if it ran against the convictions of the decision makers. They would not have wanted to know. There is a spy school in Japan, the Rear Staff Training School or Nakano School. Of course, the 1900 officers, they turn out during the war, get training in real intelligence operation. They also get something else though, ideological training. The basis is Kokutai Gaku, study for national structure and mind. And what the students call their mental and spiritual Bible, Yino Shokoki, record of the legitimate succession of the divine emperors. Hold on, a book from the 14th century. The goal is to make them loyal integrated officers inside of a strict hierarchy who are ready to never give up, but also never disobey the system. It's pretty much the exact opposite of the flexibility, inventiveness and disregard of rules that all the other war nations intelligence operations follow. The premise is that the system must be followed and what is said from the top or what fits the stated goals is more right than reality. Under that premise, intelligence that does make it to the Imperial Navy's Operation Bureau is often ignored or misinterpreted. Exaggerated reports about troop numbers or battle results are often accepted without much scrutiny. As the Navy's Operation Bureau continues to ignore the Intelligence Bureau findings, they report to have sunk the US aircraft carrier Lexington six times. In 1944, battle reports suggest that the Japanese managed to sink 19 US aircraft carriers, while the US only has 17 at that time. In reality, not a single one was sunk. At times, it gives rise to pure comedy, like when Emperor Hirohito is informed of another naval victory and replies, if I'm not mistaken, the sinking of the Saratoga, I believe, is the fourth such time, isn't it? But what about these dolls that I mentioned? Well, it again verges on comedy. The letters were not even posted from the same states as the return addresses. The women are found and they vehemently deny having written the letters and have no idea how their fake signatures ended up on the letter. Eventually, they find the common link. All of them are customers of an antique doll shop in New York City. It's owned by Valeva Dickinson, but she is at first nowhere to be found. In fact, she has already long stopped working for the Japanese having covered her financial needs. She has retired to nurse her dying husband and disappeared. When the FBI finally track her down and arrest her in 1944, they find thousands of dollars with serial numbers directly linked to the Japanese. So why did she send the letters from the wrong states? Well, because it was mostly information gathered from what anybody could observe by going down to the harbor, which she did, 
when she was on holiday on the West Coast, and then hmm, she just sent the letters. And this is how a typical operation of Japanese intelligence in World War II runs, and why our Japanese staff officer from earlier will say, we had no tradition of being interested in other societies and what they were doing. It came as a total shock to realize how powerful the Allies were becoming and how much they knew about our actions and intentions. If you want to understand how the Japanese military bureaucracy could get so crazy, watch our Between Two Wars episode, Japan, the bureaucratic war machine, over here. Become a part of uncovering more interesting and fun stuff like this by joining the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. And I will see you next time, darlings. Mm -hmm.